Hey everybody, Victor here, and for today we're heading into Sub-Saharan Africa with a nation guide for the Congo. And of course the first thing we're going to be talking about, because it's one of my guides, is the Estates and Privileges. You still have the Monarch Point Generators and you have the Supremacy over the Tribal Kingdom for Loyalty and Patronage of the Arts for Prestige, so that's all pretty standard. What is different, however, is right here, the Embrace Singular Cult. See, as a fetishist nation, whenever you have a new ruler come into power, you get to pick a cult. And at the start of the game as Congo, you have three available. You have Improved Relations, 2.5% Discipline, and Tolerance of the True Faith plus 2. Now, the way that basically is, is Discipline doesn't matter early game. It doesn't help you. So that's kind of useless. Improved Relations is about aggressive expansion decay, and honestly, you're not going to have to even worry about a coalition possibly forming for at least 50 years, if not more. So improved relations is also equally worthless. So you're locking in with tolerance of the true faith because this will at least reduce your unrest. Here's the thing. The way this privilege works is instead of you picking a new cult every time a new ruler ascends to the throne, you don't do that. You're locking yourself in for 50 years. However, you change it by using this decision right here and it's unlocked from the start. So basically this first one, it is not 50 years long, it is however long you choose to have it. You click this, and you can pick a new one. Clicking this makes you lose one stability, you take one more unrest, and you get your stability cost modifier go up. But you'll find other cults later on that are going to be significantly better than two Tolerance of the True Faith. On top of that, whenever you revoke this privilege, it's going to cost you one stability. So why would you want to do that? It is because right underneath all that you can see no stability loss on Monarch Death. Which means you're going to bump up your stability and leave this there because it's not going to benefit you to change it for a very long time. And in exchange, you're not taking stability loss. Which means after you bump up your one stability, you're then going to go back into your states and privileges and you're going to grant two more. Specifically, Aristocratic Counselors to reduce your advisor cost, because your stability cost modifier really doesn't matter. And then you're also going to grant Commercial Advisory Board for the exact same reason. Now the reason why you are not granting the Clerical Advisory Council is because right now your influence level of clergy is significantly higher than the Equilibrium Loyalty Amount. Which means if you add this, it's going to make it almost impossible to revoke anything out of the clergy when you want to. At this point, you will have to complete a clergy diet mission, as well as sell them titles in order to revoke this later on. So just be aware, do not grant this until you are absolutely certain you'll be able to revoke things later. But with that, you guys are done with the estates and privileges, so now let's move on to your military. Now as is tradition with this channel, setting up your military is pretty quick and painless. You're just going to hire the free company in your capital. You can hire the Yaka Free Warriors if you really want to, namely if they have a great general, but they're not going to be necessary for your first expansion war. So don't worry about just using the free company, you'll be fine. Now, you also need to go in here and hire a military advisor. The reason why is because this mission here, found an army, requires you to have a military advisor, 100% your force limit, and grant the military power privilege, Primacy of the Mani, and by doing that, you'll have permanent claims over a pretty big chunk of the Congo. So simply by getting this done, especially with the free company, lets you get this done incredibly quickly. Now as far as this advisor is concerned, if you do not want to keep them, because let's say you don't have a morale guy, you can fire him once you're done with the mission. And with that being done, all you need to do is take your navy here of Barks and set them to private, uh, protect trade and mothball your cogs. You're not going to need them anytime soon, and you really don't have anybody to worry about because you're not going to be fighting anybody that actually borders the coast. It's always going to be pushing into the interior. And with that, your military is set up. Let's briefly talk about diplomacy. Specifically, do not get an ally. While it might be tempting to have an ally either in the Congo, Rwanda, or even the Mutapa regions, all of them are going to take so long for them to become useful to you that by the time they do, you're already breaking that alliance so that you can attack them. So don't bother finding an ally. You don't need them. You'll be fine. And all you'll be doing is slowing yourself down waiting for a truce timer. With all of that being said, we're done talking about diplomacy. Now that all the setup's been done, it is time to unpause the game, move my troops to the border with Tio, because they're your first target and hire a general. 
I strongly do not recommend making your ruler into a general, because he's pretty good, and you want to try and keep him around as long as possible. And as far as his heir is concerned, that's kind of up to you. I like him, though, so go ahead and do what you want to do. Now it's time to complete this mission, get my claims down, allowing me to declare on him. Now it doesn't matter if he ends up getting an ally. It doesn't even matter if he gets two. He is your first target every single time. If he ends up getting an ally, it looks like I can co-belligerate just to make myself a little bit easier because that way I can take his provinces as well without paying an increased diplo cost. If you all be calling in other people, obviously you don't have to, depending on how annoying that would be. But with this, it is time to declare, go in, stack wipe this guy, and have my vassal siege it out, and then come over here and take care of Cuba. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording, because, again, this is just going to be watching sieges. I'll see you guys in just a little bit. And welcome back, everybody. So I'm now able to piece them both out. Now, if I go to Cuba here, and I try and full annex them and take their money, because you want to get their money, it's going to cost me 32 diplo power, because I'm piecing out somebody separately. However, if I go over here and piece them out from Tio, I can still full annex them, not pay any diplo power, but I'm not getting the 35 ducats. Whether or not you think the 35 ducats are worth the 32 diplo power, that's a personal opinion. I don't think it is, so I'm gonna do this. However, if you want the money early on, feel free to. Just be aware you're gonna be slightly behind in terms of diplo power. And each time you do this, you can make a judgment call on whether or not it's worth the Diplo power as opposed to doing something else. So I'm going to go ahead and core all this up, or at least core up what I can. And now I get to look at who I get to expand into next. If you want to take your time and core more of this up between fights, go ahead. That, that is perfectly fine. There is nothing to be worried about. You're able to expand so fast, you can take your time and still be fine with this. So I'm going to go ahead and declare Anyaka, who I know I can co-belligerate Kasanje here without calling anybody else in, because both of these two guys are calling this guy over here, which I wouldn't be able to take, and I don't want to deal with that. So I'm going to leave Kasan uh, Kalundwe out and attack these guys. So again, I'm going to blitz down at least one of their armies, try and get Kasanje's army out, or Kalundwe's over here, and let my vassals siege down their capitals where able, and if not, use my free company. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording again, because, again, it's mainly just me hunting down armies to try and run away and standing on forts. So I'll see you guys in just a little bit. And welcome back. As you can see, war is over. I took this guy out separately because I didn't want to bother with that, allowing me to take the rest of these guys, and I'm going to take the money. I'm doing this in large part because I cannot piece this guy out separately and take all of his money, which I would rather have right now, but it's still fine, and with that, I'm done there. Now I'm able to complete a couple of missions. I have this one, which will give me a couple of more claims, as well as some army tradition, making my army punch even harder, and that's because I took all of the provinces I had claims on, including giving me claims on this guy that was right here. The other thing I can do is, it will be a mission right here, and what this does is it reduces the autonomy in Enziku, which is where Tio was, down to zero, and give me local goods produced for 25 years. So before you click that mission, go in here, increase autonomy to get rid of the unrest, and then click this, which will set it to zero. Meaning you have no unrest, no rebels, and no autonomy in the province. And because you kept going through and you took out Kuba, you can also do this, which will give you even better armies and more prestige, as well as, yes, even more claims. Yeah, as I said, you expand stupidly fast here. Now, you have a couple of already made states here. Don't make the rest of them states yet. You're going to be waiting on that until you've annexed both of your vassals in another six years. So, at this point, it's time to start coring more things up, after I reduce my war exhaustion, and there we go. Now I'm going to go ahead and attack, let's see here, it doesn't look like it really matters who I attack. Yeah, doesn't matter whatsoever. So I'm going to attack, oh, got to unpause for a couple of days. Yeah, interesting. That's fun. Either way, I'm going to have to pause it because I'm going to be attacking these guys and I will see you guys after that is completed and I'm done coring stuff up. See you guys in a little bit. 
And welcome back, everybody. So I have not fully cored everything up yet, as you can plainly see. However, I did finish that fight, which meant I was able to complete the two missions right here and right here, which gives me colonies right here and Lega up here. Now, none of these will actually trigger the natives rising up to burn them down, so you can just let them go, especially since sometimes they can even spawn with gold, and you'll have increased goods produced by not taking out the natives. Now, that is not exactly a very common thing for it to spawn with, but I have seen it happen in one of my test runs, so hopefully you get lucky. And with completing those missions, I also have the final couple of cores down here in the Congolese area. Now during this time, you will not get claims up here, so it's time to start manually justifying and getting claims down on Rwanda, and then using Rwanda as a subject that will have claims on up in this area as well, allowing you to start expanding in that direction, as well as down here on Batua, or Mutapa, as they still control them. So I'm going to go ahead and let that happen, keep coring things up, I'm able to embrace that, and waiting for these two guys to be willing to be integrated. So I'm going to go ahead and keep fighting rebels and dealing with that nonsense, I'll see you guys in just a little bit. And welcome back everybody. As you can see, I integrated my two vassals over here, and I replaced them with Rwanda as my next vassal. However, by doing so, that means I'm able to complete this mission, Luango and Nundango's Fate, which gives me a hundred support for feudalism in my capital, which means you don't have to dev feudalism, and I highly recommend you don't. Because by doing this and not stating anything else, the cost is still reasonably cheap. This is why you don't state any of this at first, also for saving on admin power. But by doing this now, suddenly I'm able to get the military advantage on all of my fetishist neighbors and try to keep up with Kilwa over here, who's still ahead of me in Miltech even after that. Now, eventually you're going to have to dev Renaissance. There's no way around that one. But if you look at your dev map mode or your terrain map mode, you'll notice that there are plenty of grassland provinces that you can go ahead and develop up if you so choose. I would personally do this one. It has the best trade good, but it's kind of your call. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and continue to keep expanding. I'm going to use my Rwandan vassal up here to feed all of this land. And then eventually, after this is done, I'm going to go after Mutapa over here because I should be able to get a good chunk out of them, if not all of them. It depends on how this fight goes. But if they lose, fine. I'll have a little bit less to take, but I'll have cores to reconquer. If they win, I should hopefully take most of them, if not all of them. But with all of that said, I'll see you guys in just a little bit. And welcome back, everybody. So as you can see, Rwanda has substantially been fed, and I'm now going after Mutapa. They are under 100 war score even after that war with Kilwa, meaning I'm going to be able to full annex and release them as a subject. Now the reason why I'm taking these guys as subjects is because I don't plan on actually integrating them for a little while. The reason why is I'm saving up Monarch points, both Admin and Diplo. The reason why is I'm going to be trying to spawn colonialism in my lands. Not dev push, but actually spawn it. Now there's a way to do that where you basically are playing beat the clock, and trying to get yourself up to the appropriate tech level and colonize up here in time to be able to try and reach over here. And that's certainly a way of doing it, but there's a bit easier of a way. You see, I just spent a quite a number of Monarch points to get my capital up to 30 and dev five other provinces in my country up to 10 because that allowed me to complete the Develop Congo mission. This mission, once you do those things, allows you to get a free colonist ten, and then 10 settlers whenever you colonize something until you end up getting a colonist in one of your ideas. So if you get exploration or expansion ideas, it will replace this colonist. But until then, I have one for free. After that, to simply select the native repression because you're going to need a lot more settlers than just 15. And that allows you to colonize other provinces that are not colonized yet. Now, generally people will want to use this to complete this mission, which requires you to have both of these provinces colonized, and that will give you some centers of trade, as well as gems being produced and development to help boost your economy. But that's not what we're going to do. Instead, we're going to colonize right here next to Benin. The reason why is we're hoping that we'll be able to see Benin relatively quickly and allow us to attack Benin. By being able to attack Benin, we're getting into Western Africa. 
and once we're able to attack into that region, we can steal their maps, allowing us to colonize even further afield before we would even have our idea unlocked. That way, we're going to be able to colonize into Brazil and have a chance to spawn colonialism. Now, right now, I'm fighting down in Mutapa, meaning I can't really do this. Since it's a normal settler, that means, or sorry, a normal colonist, that means the natives can rise up and destroy the colony. And since they're extremely aggressive, they're likely to. And I just don't have the troops to go over there and help defend it or clear them out. So instead of bothering with that for now, I'm going to finish this war with Mutapa, then come up here and deal with this, and hopefully get some vision on Benin. Now, whether or not you guys go for colonialism, that's up to you. But considering the fact that I've already going to have to spawn Renaissance, I don't want to have to spawn yet another thing when the Europeans are going to reach me far sooner than they would ever have had done with Korea. They I'm willing to deal with having to spawn with it. I don't want to do that with Congo because that way I'm not too far behind in tech. So I'm going to go ahead and pause it again because I need to finish this war, start expanding, hopefully get into Benin, and then continue from there. I will see you guys in just a little bit. And welcome back, everybody. As you can see, I now have Vision past Benin. The reason why is I did take Exploration as my first idea group, which gives me quests for the New World. I got a Conquistador and Military Access, which let me explore the coastline. Now, here's the general concept of what you're doing to try and get colonialism. Since I colonized Calabar right here, I now have colonial range to reach the Ivory Coast. Once that's done being colonized, I drop a colony in Beafada. Don't need to wait for it to finish, but that will give me option to get claims on Fulo, take Fulo's land, and then core it to be allowing me to reach the new world from those new cores. And you need to try and do this before 1500. Now, if you have a bad diplomatic ruler here, then you're going to have to use the conquest route. If, however, you're able to get enough diplo points through advisors and a good monarch and focusing and all of that, then you might be able to get to tech 7, as well as the third idea group here, and then hire a colonial range advisor that can get you to reach Beafada without having to do anything with the Ivory Coast, which will save you a massive amount of time. So if you're able to skip over, absolutely do it. Even if you have to stop a mid-progress here and then move your colonists over here, it is absolutely worth it because you want to have colonialism spawn in your land. That is the first point I wanted to talk about now. The second one is, since now the Europeans have found me, I believe it was the Portuguese, I had an event where I was able to flip to Catholicism. I recommend you do not do it, especially if you're going for the, the achievement where you have enough cults unlocked, because obviously you're not unlocking any cults as a Catholic. However, after that event starts, you'll have some provinces decide they want to be Catholic, and they will spawn Catholic rebels. Let them siege out one of your provinces. The reason why is you unlock cults either by fighting people or bordering them. And by having it flip to a Catholic province over here, you're bordering Catholics, which will unlock the Christian cult, allowing you to get that one completely out of the way. So that is one of 13 done, and you will get it another three up here and then you'll get another three in Madagascar so that is now 10 I have quick access to and then I have the Muslims over here which will be 11 so I only need to find two more and since I'm going exploration the easiest ones to get are up here in the Nahuatl and then down here in the Inti wait sorry I forgot there is no Inti one so I'd have to go over here to India and either get Hindu or even further to get the Eastern one from them now, there is a mission in here that you need to complete. That is right here, once you have unlocked four, which Christian will do it, where you are allowed to use your heir to pick a minor version of a cult. This is not limited based off of this privilege. So every time you have a new heir, you'll get a minor one of these bonuses. So one, tolerance of the true faith, as opposed to two. Or half the improved relations, half the discipline, half of whatever it happens to be. Now... There are some really good ones out there, so use your air to determine whether or not there's something out there you'd rather flip this to, to click this button. I have yet to find anything else that's better, so I'm not going to even bother. And then after that mission is done, once you have the air being able to pick their own minor cult, there's one down here that you need to complete, where 
you have a lot of cults unlocked and it will allow you to unlock one of your choice but it has to be from a culture or another religion that you know of what this means is you don't have to fight them nor do you have to colonize near them or anything like that so what you do is after you're done expanding into Kilwa explore up towards India and once you see them you can then finish this mission or once you finish this mission there's an option to save it and use it to get that without having to fight any Hindi nation in India or Eastern denomination or Zoroastrian or Jewish or whatever you happen to want to grab without having to fight them because you don't know if they'll still be around but with all of that said I'm gonna go ahead and pick one in here I I'm gonna go with trade power because why not and I'm gonna go ahead and keep playing and try and get colonialism to spawn because after that then I can start expanding yet again and I can start going after people like Kilwa because well I'm still kind of behind them in military tech but I should catch up by then so I will see you guys in just a little bit and welcome back everybody as you can see it's been a number of years since you guys were here last so let's go ahead and cover what's happened so you guys can keep up see what I did and see what you're trying to replicate First things first, yes, I did get colonialism to spawn in my country, which stops me from having to dev push yet another institution, at least for about 40 more years. Now, I did have to restart the game multiple times using Alt F4 to get this to happen. If you think that's an exploit, or if you just don't want to deal with that, that's perfectly fine. You'll just have to create a colonial nation in the new world. As long as you create a colonial nation, you'll get the natural spread, and it spreads pretty quickly in your country, so there is that option too. I just didn't want to deal with it because I don't want to be doing this that long, especially since I'm relying on just one colonist. So again, it's up to you. As you can see, I do have my colony here and it's still going on. The reason why is I'm planning to move my colony and keep colonizing towards Mexico. Not because I actually want land in Mexico because it really doesn't do anything for me for trade reasons, but for the explicit purpose of genlocking another cult. The reason why is the Nahuatl and the Mayans have a cult for themselves called Teotl. This gives you 5% morale of armies and with your heir 7.5% in total, meaning your armies become a whole lot stronger, especially in the early game before discipline starts to take over. Now here's the nice thing, if you don't actually want to go to Mexico and fight somebody there, you don't necessarily have to. As long as you get here and you can see Musica, you have a mission called Shamanistic Alliances. This allows you to unlock a cult without actually fighting or colonizing next to somebody, which is very, very, very useful. Now, once you select that, you have an event which will let you unlock one, but there is an option to, I don't want to pick one right now, become a decision, I'll pick later, which is what I did here. As you can see, I can just click it whenever I want, and it gives me all of the cults that I know exist that I have not unlocked yet. So Teotl is right here, and I can click it now without having to go to Mexico. I'm not going to because there are two others I'd rather get. Specifically, I'd rather get the Buddhist or Eastern religion one of Confucianism, Buddhist, etc., which gives me 10% development cost, which with the heirs 15, allowing me to play extremely tall, or the Hindu one, or Sheik one, and that one gives me 10% goods produce. The reason why the goods produce is so nice is goods, produce stacks with your gold mines and yes I have four gold mines meaning once I get these dev pushed to 10 add in the 15 percent goods produced my economy is going to be set the rest of the game and I don't need to rely on trade or anything else now at this point I still have my colonist and I have not actually done anything else with exploration ideas I don't have to take more to get to this point my next goal, however, is not to push north, though I am going to continue to push north. It is instead to push east. The reason why is over in Indonesia, you have both Hindu tags as well as Buddhist tags, allowing you to get both of those cults unlocked. I also need to expand into Madagascar and then continue expanding into West Africa. And I just fought Kilwa, so that for right now is done. But basically, you want to get exploration so you can see all of Africa and then once that is done you can go ahead and throw this away because unless you're going for extra cults which makes it easier to have exploration so you can go to Indonesia you don't necessarily need it at this point but with that being said I'm gonna go ahead and continue exploring so I can show you the last few steps that I need to talk about so you guys will have a full understanding of what you're doing as the Congo 
See you guys in just a little bit. And welcome back, everybody. So what I've been waiting for has finally arrived. Specifically, the Europeans have decided that their own continent up here sucks really bad, and that Africa is better in every way. So they're not just going to colonize the islands off the coast here, they're going to join me on the mainland and colonize both South Africa as well as the West in Guinea. Now this brings up the final subject that I wanted to cover in this guide. Specifically, how do you deal with the Europeans? The reason I want to talk about this is if you're anything like me, you get some serious anxiety whenever you play outside of Europe. And that anxiety is pretty simple. What are the Europeans going to do to me when they arrive? And the root of this anxiety is because if you're like me, and like most people that play this game, the countries you played first when you started playing were in Western Europe. And this is important because when you play in Western Europe and you go colonial, you'll go and you'll fight people in the Americas or Africa or India or China and you'll wipe the floor with them almost every single time. And the reason why is you're usually three to five military techs ahead of people. And the reason why is because you're a player and all the institutions spawn in Europe unless there's a player interfering. So you have some major advantages. However, whenever you're playing outside of Europe, you can flip the script. And I wanted to point out why and how you can take advantage of this so you guys realize that you have less to worry about from Europe, though you do still have to be a little bit wary. So the two fundamental points to understand are one, you are not AI, you are better than AI. And two, they are AI and they are that bad. And by understanding these two points, it helps with that anxiety. So let's talk about the first one, you are not AI. So you're not AI and it gives you two distinct advantages that the AI just can't handle. One is blobbing. No matter how hard the AI tries, no AI Congo is going to be this big. They're going to be about this size, which is the size of basically their mission tree. They might colonize some other provinces here and there with their colonists, but generally speaking, they're going to limit their expansion. They're not going to push into Mutapa, they're not going to get into West Africa, they're just not going to be doing that. And the reason why is they're just not equipped to handle it. But the second thing they're really not equipped to handle is dev pushing. They almost never, no AI, dev pushes an institution very well. They, they just can't handle it. As a result, they fall behind so much in technology that they have that three to five military deficit. Meaning that by the time the Europeans show up, they're able to just walk over them because their units are three times stronger than anything that they would have. So on top of the behind in technology, a Congo that's about this size would have a force limit of about 30,000 to 40,000 at this point. And they'd be about four military techs behind just on average. Now comparing Castile right now, who has Miltech 16, that means I should be at Miltech 12 and half their army size. But when you look at it, I'm Miltech 15 and I have 136,000 force limit, meaning I have a larger army with more manpower than Castile does. The last advantage you have is you're able to pick the idea groups that are beneficial to you at the time. Other than Castile and Portugal who are kind of hardwired to always take expansion and exploration early, everyone else is kind of just random. Sometimes they'll take exploration and expansion, sometimes they won't. Most of the time, anybody outside of Western Europe, they don't take those exploration and expansion, but they're completely random what they happen to take. You, on the other hand, can pick what is useful to you or follow the meta. So you're able to pick and choose and make strong and strategic choices that the AI just can't handle. And with that, you're better than the AI. Not to mention proper reinforcement, all the other things that you have. So now let's talk about what makes the AI so bad about having to fight you, given the fact that you are the Congo. The AI is also really, really bad at intercontinental warfare, and Portugal's the best example I can give you in the current game. So Portugal in this game owns Goa. They got it through an event. Now let's say Portugal wanted to own all of India. Given the fact they have 96,000 troops and VJ over here only has 53, that's actually not completely unreasonable. As a player, for me to do that, I'd simply move as many troops as I could sustain in Goa without attrition killing them. I'd put the rest of them over here in their other colony, or in these open provinces so they don't take attrition. And then right before I declare, I'd move another stack into Goa and declare and scatter my troops in where I at least have parity with VJ in terms of units. So I'd have 
about 50,000 in the area. And then I move the rest of them up as quickly as I can, so I outnumber VJ, and then just go to town, and take over India. Makes sense. The AI cannot handle that kind of forethought. See, we can plan ahead by multiple steps. We can decide, okay, as Spain, if I'm invading the Congo, I'll log load these three islands up with as many troops as they can handle before attrition sets in, and then I'll declare and I'll invade, say, here, and then quickly drop off all of my troops into this one province, because then I'm behind their fort line. I'm able to attack them and they can't stop me. But they can't think that far ahead. Instead, Portugal or Castile will just declare the war. They will not have, Portugal will not have anybody in this entire region of the world, and they'll just declare. And they will either just stand there and lose, or just send some ships to blockade VJ, thinking that'll somehow work, and lose Goa, and never have it again, lose their opportunity to invade India. Or they'll try and do naval invasions. And here's the thing. In my six and a half thousand hours of playing this game, I have not seen an AI navy larger than about 25% to 33% of their total navy size, not force limit, the actual size of their navy, be more than transports unless they're losing ships in a war. So here, they're at peace, they have 104 ships, about 25 to maybe 27 of those ships are going to be transports. Which means instead of having the 53,000 to at least reach unit parity with VJ, they're going to be invading with about 27,000 infantry or units at a time. Meaning they'll send all the way around here, taking naval attrition the entire time with that army, to come up here and naval invade and land on the coast and have that army just be wiped out by VJ. Because they're outnumbered 2 to 1 before the attrition even set in and probably reduced to maybe 10,000 by the time they actually get there because the AI is really bad at intercontinental warfare. The other thing they'll do is sometimes they will send troops. Sometimes they actually put them on the borders of people, as you can see, England did here. Now, what makes them do that is they'll only send the amount of troops they think they can spare from their homeland. In this case, Portugal and Castile, they've been fighting France, who is stronger than about both of them combined. So they're terrified France is going to attack them. Portugal's also worried that Morocco or Tunis will attack them, because of course they are. So that means there's no troops anywhere in any of these areas, because they can't afford it. France, on the other hand, could in theory put troops down here, but they have to watch out for Portugal and Castile, because they might come back to get their land back. Whereas England, it's only bordering France with one province, which is kind of important, but not that important, so they dropped about... 60,000 troops on my border. The problem is that's their entire army. So this is more of defensive because this is probably more valuable to them than Calais is. However, that's how they want to invade intercontinental. The way the AI attacks people is in one of two ways. Either by a land invasion, which will depend on what's available to them, or through a naval one. Now, if Castile wanted to attack me in a land invasion, it becomes a conga line. What I mean by that is, there are so many narrow pathways to get into my land that you're able to funnel them down and force them into bad fights on defensive terrain using choke point forts. If you look right here with the province next to them as being fort capable, you have fort, 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 before they can even start spreading out. They're locked in to these few provinces with each one of them having a fort. I can build three right now because Timbuktu is a subject of mine. And then even if they get past those four forts, I have down here nothing but jungle terrain of fort, 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 fort. So for them to get into my actual heartland, because all of this isn't actually cord, they're going to have to go through so many forts, they're going to lose most of their actual manpower to simple attrition. And even if they don't, I'm going to be able to fight them on every single fort as they go along, allowing the fort to give me time to breathe and recover my troops while they're not recovering them due to attrition, because all of this is bad terrain, especially since I've devved over here to make it so I actually have supply limit, but there's nothing over here, making it really bad for them to actually have to keep their troops over here 
So I can just win through sheer attrition and time if I need to. Now again, naval invasions, you've already heard about it. They're really bad about it. Look at their size of their navy, about 25% to 30%. That's about what they're going to have in terms of actual transports. But they can still do a naval invasion. They can still land on your coasts and try and push inward. So try and build forts along your coastline so that they, even if they do land, they're locked into wherever they landed or a couple of provinces there. This will give you time to move your armies around. So let's say Spain attacked and they landed here. I have an army here ready to engage them, but I have time because of this fort to move these reinforcement stacks up because that will allow me to keep them on this fort long enough for me to attack them with numerical superiority. Or even if I don't have the tech advantage, I'll at least have the numbers advantage. The last thing to keep in mind is you get to decide what the war goal will be as long as you're the attacker. So Spain, if or Castile, if they wanted to attack me, they would of course attack this province. Because they can get a claim here, and while they can also get a claim down here, there's no way for them to actually defend this land, make certain they have a naval invasion in this land, or anything else. It's really vulnerable down here. So the Spain will likely want to attack here and not south. So would Portugal. They'd want to attack here, or they'd want to attack over here if they could actually get a claim because of obvious reasons. So what you do instead is you get your claim down here where they can't defend it and attack in the south. This is why I didn't even fight them down here. I didn't try and colonize down here. Because there's about, with the 25% of war score from just taking this province, there's about 75% war score of what Castile has decided to colonize down here that I can just take. I don't need to fight for it. I don't need to really do anything. I can just build a 20,000 strong and then have one guy stand on every province and just siege it all down. And after that, all I need to do is make certain that they do not do a naval invasion down here that I can't stop because there's no forts down here. And that's all I need to do. I'll have 60% war score just sitting on South Africa, allowing me to take their islands, to take South Africa, or take their islands over here, locking them out of India, and preventing them from getting any stronger for the rest of the game. Then the only person I really have to worry about is France. And France, just like everybody else, won't have troops down here. And then Britain, who does, but definitely is not a threat. And then the last person I really have to worry about is either the Mamluks or the Ottomans, depending on who ends up pushing into this area. And with that, you should be more than capable of conquering all of Africa. Because after this point, there's not a whole lot of people that can actually challenge you because nobody's actually capable enough to fight in Africa better than you because you're already here. Now, the last thing to talk about are the cults. I just wanted to point out that, yes, I did get enough. You'll naturally get Christianity and Sunni, so those aren't too hard. Getting Nahuatl, that's just as easily as colonizing over here and attacking one of them. Even if you lose the war, usually you're just paying them money because they don't really want anything else from you. As far as the, the Hindu provinces and the eastern provinces over here, you have two guys over here usually. This guy right here, over here, I uh, don't believe he's still around. Nope, he is. He's Hindi. This guy is Buddhist or Theravadan, giving you a way to get the two there. Just attack them, send some troops at them, and then piece them out with a white piece as soon as you can. And you have two more there. And then you also have the mission over here to grab another one if you so desire because... There's Jewish, Zoroastrian, I'm trying to remember the other ones, but I don't remember offhand, but I'll try and remember to throw up an image that includes all of them here, because you'll have nine in all of Africa. Getting the rest really is not that hard. But with that, you guys should be more than capable of getting yourself some Congolese achievements. If you like this kind of content, like and subscribe. I will definitely be making more of it. If you want to see a particular mechanic covered or a specific kind of guide, or another country or tag, let me know in a comment below. I'm more than happy to make it. One person's already requested an economy guide, and I'm going to try and do that as soon as I can. But with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day.